We've been talking about the ellipsoid algorithm for a few lectures and then talking about how the ellipsoid algorithm gives us the equivalence between uh, four fundamental problems or, uh, or shows the equivalence in power, polynomial equivalence, um, between four oracles. Weak separation, a weak optimization, weak violation, weak validity, and weak separation. We're going to specialize this now to sets K that are not just arbitrary convex sets, but convex sets that are, uh, first of all, polytopes, but also defined by rational uh, coefficients. So uh, the definition of a rational polytope, P is a, is a, is a rational polytope, <clears throat> if P is defined in really in, in, in any way here, you know, we've talked about standard form, etc. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. You can verify that for yourself. Uh, if P is all X such that A X less than B, where uh, A and B have rational coefficients. And when we're talking about uh, rational coefficients, right, so in other words, a, i, j, and b, i, all of these belong to Q. And when we talk about rational coefficients, it's really equivalent to thinking about a and b that are defined by integers just by clearing according to a common denominator. So the, the, the description length or the, the um, the complexity of a particular uh, inequality is really the common set of inequalities is whatever that common denominator is. And um, we, we already saw some of those, the importance of some of those details when we were talking about the ellipsoid algorithm because we developed the ellipsoid algorithm in the context of, um, in the context of rational polytopes and the 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 this common denominator that was used this description the the, the, the encoding length of a and b was used in place of the side information that we needed when we were talking about uh the the um, equivalence of those weak problems remember that we needed to know a circumscribing ball and then you might also re recall that in our lectures on the ellipsoid algorithm, we gave a lemma that said that uh, there is a lower bound on the volume of a polytope that's also uh, can be obtained by the encoding length of A and B for rational coefficients. And you may ask, where did that go? Why is it that in the previous lectures on the, the, the equivalence of those four problems, we, we only had a circumscribing ball, but this is exactly why we need weak. Because remember that uh, we're, we're explicitly given that uh, epsilon as a threshold or the delta for the separation problem. So what we've got so far is uh, either we look back at the lectures that we had on ellipsoid algorithm, where now we have a lower bound on the volume that depends on the encoding length, or we need to kind of use that as separate side information, side information for a circumscribing ball, and then you know converting the strong problem into a weak problem, so that we don't have to worry about uh, the the minimum volume. That's essentially where why we didn't need that when we talked about those problems. But this lecture is going to uh, focus a little bit more specifically on um, on on rational polytopes and. The basic uh, punchline in advance, or the upshot, is that if we have upper bounds on the encoding lengths, not of all of A, but individually on facets of individual 
And this is kind of the key and the, and the main difference between what we're talking about now and what we're talking about in the lectures on an ellipsoid algorithm. Um, individual uh, facets or vertices of a polytope, again, ra uh, polyhedron, ra rational, then the solvability of weak problems implies the solvability of the strong problems. So in other words, we no longer need to make the distinction between weak and strong problems. And you know, for those of you that r recall kind of the, the, in, the intimate, more intimate details of some of the assumptions we had made, we had asked for a full dimensional, our polytopes to be full dimensional and bounded, we can also drop those. I'll just put this in parentheses. I'm not gonna focus too much of this, on this. And we can drop our previous assumptions that we made during the ellipsoid algorithm lectures on a full dimensionality and boundedness. Um, so again, uh, to kind of belabor the, the, the key point of this, because remember that you know everything that we did in ellipsoid algorithm obtained an external uh, a, a, a a circumscribing radius and a lower bound in the volume using all of the encoding length of a and b. If you if you look back at those lectures, but that's not what this is saying. And in particular, this, so this is saying that it's gonna, it's gonna, so think about that versus max over i of a i and b i. And you'll see that this is very different because if you have many, if you have an exponential number of very simple constraints, then uh, you, simple in the sense of how long, how, how big your encoding length is, your encoding length of all of a might be very, very large. But that's not what this is saying. So that, that, that's, that's why uh, this is a result that's important for us with respect to the ellipsoid algorithm. And it provides this key to the arborescence problem because we don't want to solve the weak version of the arborescence problem. And it's not clear that we want to be computing uh, minimum volumes uh, or uh, 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 we want to be computing lower bounds on the volumes of the, of the arborescence polytope. Um, or not even clear that we could could do that. We know it's bounded. All of these problems that come from graphs are sitting inside our subset of the unit cube. So we have R. That that's not so much of a problem. But but otherwise, if we tried to just verbatim apply the results of the ellipsoid algorithm lectures, we would be left with an important gap because uh, those required in terms of the running time bounds on this minimum volume and it provided bounds on the minimum volume, but those bounds used all of the complexity, the encoding length of A and B. And now we're saying don't need to do that. Okay, so, so uh, we're not going to provide all the details here, but just some of the major milestones along the way towards, uh, towards getting there. Um, a bit of a side note, but also important um, is uh, how we can use oracles on derived convex sets. And the good news is that, uh, is that, is that we can do this um, very, very effectively. Um, so uh, what I mean for derived convex sets is, uh, and, and, and we can we use all of these equivalences, um, is that given uh, K1 and K2 convex sets, what can we, say in terms of solving in terms of equivalence of those basic problems on uh, sets k that are the Minkowski sum of k1 plus k2 that's a convex set or the intersection of k1 and k2 
also a convex set. And uh, also the convex hull of the union and, and other, other operations as well. The reason that it's not completely obvious here is that if, again, if we want to imply just verbatim the results from the ellipsoid algorithm, um, we need to take care that things like minimum volume uh, are, you know, that, we, that we control for these. Um, and you can see that, for example, when you're talking about intersection, you may have a problem there. You may significantly reduce the minimum volume when you take the intersection of two sets. But again, in the spirit of, kind of a high level summary, we don't need to worry about any of these problems. Uh, we only need to worry about the uh, encoding length of individual facets or of uh, the individual vertices of, uh, of, our, of our polyhedron. And then we, can, we have equivalence of all of those basic uh, strong and weak problems for uh, these derived convex sets as well. Okay, so, on, so I want to give the, uh, some ba the basic definitions that we need here and then a few of the basic lemmas. Um, we're, we're not going to go into delve into all of the proofs. The intuition is that, uh, is, uh, is that if you can solve the weak problem and you have a discrete structure like a polytope, then you should just be able to round and get yourself to a corn. That intuition, maybe at an extremely high level, is correct, but it is a bit dangerous because uh, we need to make assumptions about how far apart extreme points are from each other. So if you've solved the weak optimization problem, you're, it's not, you, you need additional assumptions on your polytope to make sure that a particular rounding procedure doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't round you to the wrong vertex. But there are tools um, that, that can deal with this. And we're not gonna go into, into all of the details in this lecture. We're just gonna give the basic results that we, uh, that we, that we have. Okay, so let's, let's give the basic, uh, the important definitions here. If P is in N dimensions a polyhedron, And I have positive integers, which I'm going to call phi and nu. So this is my notation. These are positive integers. Then we say that P has facet complexity phi if there exists some system of inequalities. Oops. Uh, I need to move things around a little bit just because of, um, it's not, it doesn't affect your view, but it affects the view, um, the view of the, uh, of the recording. Uh, some system of inequalities <clears throat> uh, with rational coefficients, of course, describing P such that the encoding length, and you can always think of the encoding length of a bunch of rational numbers as essentially being whatever that common denominator is uh, there of each individual inequality, not all of them together, is less than phi. Okay, so that's the definition of, of uh, facet complexity. And similarly, vertex complexity is uh, the, the description length of each vertex. Um, if P is equal to the convex hull of vertices containing the set of points V. Plus, uh, because I'm allowing this to be a polyhedron, um, we know that uh, any polyhedron, bounded or unbounded, if it's bounded, 
then the polytope, of course, is just the convex hull of its extreme points. If it's unbounded, the convex, the, uh, the, the polytope is the Minkowski sum between the convex hull of its extreme points plus the cone that's defined by its extreme rays, um, such that each vertex V and each ray R and E has encoding length at most nu, then we say that P has vertex complexity nu. And uh, a side note here is that if P is equal to all of Rn, then we also then we require then it has no inequalities that define it. So we require that phi, you can think about this as a convention, that phi is basically n plus one. And then for vertices, if p is equal to the empty set, in other words, has no extreme rays and no, uh, and no extreme points, then we just ask for nu to be bigger than n. This is just a convention. You can see it's not particularly interesting. We're not gonna be spending too much time worried about optimization over all of Rn or, or the empty set. But this is just a convention so that all the results, um, all the results hold. And um, and so a key definition is that uh, is that that of a well-described polyhedron. So a polyhedron, a well-described this is the definition. Polyhedron P is just one that has a bounded um, description length in exactly this sense. So bounded phi or bounded nu. But we're only going to define it for bounded facet, uh, facet complexity. And the lemmas that I'm going to give will clarify exactly why that is. Essentially, those are those are all equivalent. Um, so a well-described polyhedron is a triplet P, N, and phi, where P has facet complexity controlled by phi. So here are two uh, are two lemmas. And the first lemma is basically justifying the above definition and saying that uh, it's, it's, we don't need to worry about vertices if we have bounded uh, facet complexity and vice, and vice versa. Um, oh, actually, uh, uh, um, that, that this is the, uh, the, second, the second lemma. The first, um, well, let, let's write that. Let's write it in the order that I said. So if P has facet complexity phi, then it has vertex complexity at most some multiple, that's polynomial in the things that we care about, times phi. So remember that we are allowed to be polynomial in the dimension and in the description length. So basically this is saying that if you are if you're if, if you have controlled phi, then you have controlled nu. Now let me flip back uh, to the definition here of facet complexity and point out um, and point out something, which is this existence here. So and it's something that maybe we should be worried about. The lemma that I'm going to write down tells us we don't need to be worried about it. So, you know, this says that a that a polytope P has facet complexity phi if there exists a particular representation which has a uh, controlled um, encoding length. So this might worry us because what if it's very difficult to find such a representation? Or what if what if we can't check it or something like something like that? What if we do something wrong? And basically, this the next lemma says that if 
there is a description description of P with facet complexity phi, then a standard representation, something like uh, the, um, uh, where we impose some normalization on the on the on the inequalities, uh, and, and we give it in some in one of in basically any standard form, um, has facet complexity again at most some multiple that doesn't really matter to us uh, times phi. So again, obviously we're focused on the phi here, not the thirty-five. Um, And uh, finally, let me give the companion lemma to, uh, to, to this one. So the first lemma says that if you have bounded facet complexity, then you have bounded vertex complexity. The companion lemma is uh, if, I'll just write it in, in, in the thread here, if, if P has vertex complexity nu, then phi is at most, 3 n squared times nu. So in other words, what this slide tells us is that if we have a well-described polyhedron, the representation is not that important. And moreover, it's, uh, if it has controlled facet, if its facet complexity and its vertex complexity are both, uh, are both related in a polynomial way. So having a small complexity either with respect to individual vertices or individual facets is... Um, is enough for us. Okay, so now I want to connect this to uh, the weak and strong problems. Again, we're not, we're not, I'm not going to go into the proofs of either what I just presented or of, or of this slide. So the first lemma says that uh, we can find a uh, circumscribing ball that is a function of the vertex complexity. And by virtue of the previous lemma, this tells us that we can find a circus, circumscribing ball as a function of the, of the uh, facet complexity. Um, if P is full dimensional, uh, with vertex complexity, oops, pardon me, um, with vertex complexity nu, then all vertices of P are contained. This is very straightforward. Um, basically, just comes from encoding what encoding length means. And the second lemma says that uh, if we have a controlled facet complexity, then P must contain a ball of minimum of a, of a particular minimum radius. So for P as above, with now facet complexity controlled by phi, then P contains a ball with radius at least 2 to the minus 7n cubed phi. Again, turn back to the results we gave for uh, the ellipsoid during the ellipsoid algorithm lectures, and you'll see that instead of phi there, we had uh, something that depended on the encoding length of all together the inequalities and this this is the main uh, the, the, the main difference um, here okay so the connection to uh, the weak and strong problems finally is uh, I'll give that in, in, in two lemmas if P is an RN a polytope uh, with facet complexity controlled by phi then let 
y be any vector with rational coefficients uh, such that the entries of y have common denominator that's controlled have common denominator at most q then and this is the key point about rounding if y is an element of s p 1 over q 2 to the minus 2 phi. So again, let's just parse this notation. This is, remember, uh, s of k epsilon is the epsilon expansion. So this is saying that if y is this close to some point of p, then, in fact, y is in p. So this is what gets us from weak to strong problems. And you can see the critical role that phi is uh, playing in this, uh, in this game. And the next lemma says that, again, if uh, P is in Rn, now with vertex complexity that's controlled, then we can almost predict what we're going to write. Right? So this first inequality is saying, remember that there is this duality dual relationship between uh, facets and extreme points, the violation problem and the, and, the, and, the, and the separation problem. And this previous lemma is saying that if you control facet complexity, then if you are almost in the polytope P, you're actually in the polytope P. If, if you can show that you're almost, then you are guaranteed to be in it. And, and then now this is saying if you can control the vertex complexity, then if, we have an inequality, A transpose X less than B is an integral inequality. I essentially needed this above as well. That's why I needed this common denominator. It is an integral inequality that is uh, almost valid for P. In other words, i.e. A transpose X is less than B plus a little something, plus two to the minus uh, nu plus one. Again, you know, where did Q go in this story? If I have an inequality, I could just scale everything up by Q. So I could have just not scaled this and divided this additional threshold, 2 to the minus nu plus 1, divided that by q instead of scaling a and b to make them integers. Um, so this says this lemma says that if, if an inequality is almost feasible for p, then in fact it is, then it is uh, valid for p. So if ax less than b is uh, holds for all x in p, then in fact a transpose x is less than b for all x and p. It's saying that those are, um, again, how we get from the weak problem to the strong problem. We needed to do it for feasibility of a point, and we needed to do it for validity of an inequality constraint. And that covers our, uh, that covers our, key, uh, our key problems. So uh, the summary is that um, for well-described, oops, for uh, for well-described polyhedra, first of all, the four strong problems are equivalent. And also, the weak oracles solve the strong problems. In the previous lecture, we gave the relationship between, we said that those four strong problems are, four weak problems are equivalent. We did not say that about the strong problems. This is saying that 
Maybe it makes more sense to write B first here. It's saying since the weak oracles solve the strong problems, then it's saying that in fact, all in addition, the, the four strong problems are equivalent. So this brings us to the end of our lectures on ellipsoid algorithm and some of the techniques that go into proving it and also how we're going to apply it and why it applies so directly to problems like the R arborescence problem. Um, after this, we're going to go, be going into uh, talking about uh, uh, back to problems like the R arborescence problem and talking about how to use all these tools that we've developed uh, for problems in uh, polyhedral combinatorics. We will pick that up next time.